Please welcome AMD's Executive Vice President and General Manager, Data Center Solutions Business Group, Forrest Norod. Hey, good morning. It's great to be here with all of you. It's a very large crowd, super impressive. Uh, I remember 12 years ago, uh, talking at the first uh, OCP meeting back in the, the Facebook buildings, and, and my, how the organization has grown since then. And the importance of what you have, are doing, what we all are doing together, has never been more important. Today I want to talk about how we harness everything that we've done over the last 10 years to meet some of the looming challenges in the data center. And the, challenge, the biggest challenge, of course, is the one that you've heard from multiple people already, the challenge that the AI systems are going to bring to the data center. And so first off, um, I'm very proud to say that AMD has been a close partner of Open Compute since the beginning, with participation on the steering and incubation committee and across many uh, different subcommittees over the years. And it's been our pleasure to support the development of all of those different technologies and open standards to try to meet the continually evolving and growing challenges of the data center. And we've struggled, quite candidly, over the last 10 years to keep up with the insatiable demand. IT has become part of our lives in so many different ways that's generated enormous demand for IT services and put tremendous pressure on the data centers. And we've struggled to keep up with that to the point where today, about 3% of data center capacity in the world is free and available for new deployments. The rest is already in use. And we're really going to struggle, as you've heard already, to keep up with the growing demands of AI as we start contemplating clusters like Lloyd just mentioned. But AI is coming. The productivity gains we've already seen from so many of the large language model deployments means that it absolutely will become a central part of many cloud and enterprise data centers across the world. But in those data centers, even a modest AI deployment can cause a big problem. A few hundred systems, if you do the math and extrapolate from what Louie and others have said, already said, hundreds of kilowatts and can break the back of your data center. If it's already anything close to typical utilization, this might force you to build a new data center or secure a lease on long-term capacity with significant financial implications. Well, the problem, the solution to that problem is in part to build new data centers, sure, but that's impractical to meet what we think is going to be the coming tsunami of demand for AI. And so what we have to do is we've got to make a big part of the solution today's data centers. And the good news is there's a lot of them. We've got a lot of power. We've got a lot of space in those data centers. But again, the utilization is very, very high. And so to solve the problem, to use this existing asset, we have to continue to drive power efficiency in the data center across every aspect. And we need to drive performance density in the data center as well. We have to solve both sides of the equation. Now, we've made progress on energy efficiency over the last 20 years. If you take a look at, uh, and this chart is for x86 spec power uh, benchmarks of the leading system, leading x86 system. In this case, this is entirely an Intel line. We've made tremendous progress over the last 20 years in increasing the power efficiency of the fundamental element of compute, the server. In recent years, with the introduction of additional players into the data center, AMD, and of course, uh, some of the ARM entrants, we have some new perspectives on how to drive power efficiency. And luckily, we've made more progress and helped inflect all of the line, the slopes of all of the lines to get steeper so that we can make more progress going forward. But the progress that we've already made is pretty substantial, and it can lead to enormous savings. If you look back at the systems you would need to have to deploy a workload that required, say, 20 million spec int rate worth of performance, probably in that time frame, that'd be 40 or 50,000 servers. 
You, and you look at delivering that same amount of performance today with the leading uh, x86-based servers, we've seen a four to one reduction in the power required, saving 31 megawatts of power from that deployment with five-year-old technology to the deployment with the latest technology of today. So we've made a lot of progress on energy efficiency and on, on performance density as well, we've made a startling amount of progress if you step back and you look at it over the last five years. So again, the top published benchmark for a 2P server back in 2018 was 327 speculant rate for a 2P server. And today, the top benchmark is 2140. Uh, we've also, again, seen some ARM entrance at this point. So this is not just an x86 race of, of increasing performance density. But we have seen about a 7x improvement in performance density just in the last five years. If you put those two factors together, it's pretty clear that the solution for many of the most pressing immediate challenges of where do I put these AI servers is in consolidating the systems that are used for existing workloads and consolidating them with the latest technology. You can drive almost an 80% reduction in the physical space, the physical number of servers required to deliver that level of performance. And you can cut your power consumption to a quarter of what it was used previously. And again, these workloads are not going away, guys. The problem with AI is it's an additive workload that has tremendous value. But that doesn't mean that the existing uh, services, systems of record, transaction processing systems, et cetera, they're not going away either. So we have to find a way to allow the two to live together and for the legacy to give way in terms of embracing efficiency to make room for the new deployments. So great improvements over the last five years. How did we achieve this? Well, I'm a silicon guy, so most of this talk is going to be about silicon aspects, but it goes beyond that. But it does begin, in our opinion, with efficient cores. So if you take a look at uh, a, a modern core, Zen 4 core in our you know, latest generation Epic processors, that's about a little less than four square millimeters of silicon area. Um, the competitive uh, core uh, in Intel 7 today is about 10 square millimeters. And by the way, the core from five years ago is also about 10 square millimeters. I thought about drawing it on here, but you wouldn't really see much difference. And these cores are very different in area, but they're pretty similar in terms of performance. The, the AMD Epic one happens to be about 17% faster than the competitor when, when gauged core to core. So efficiency in the core, stripping out unnecessary crap, and that's, that's been, sorry, unnecessary stuff, and that's been a, a theme of OCP from the beginning. I remember Jonathan Heiliger's first blog is talking about get rid of everything unnecessary that doesn't you know, add value. That's, that's our perspective as well. In the cores, you don't have accelerators in each core for functions that are only used by a small fraction of the workload. You have a clean core, you design it efficiently, you pack them in, and then you use accelerators elsewhere, as I'll talk about in a minute. But it's not just the core, of course. It's every trick in the book. Of course, on the silicon side, process nodes, packaging, et cetera. On the system side, a lot of innovations, particularly around power, cooling, and power delivery. You know, we used to say that Moore's Law would solve all problems and you know, would, would keep driving the density and power efficiency of silicon up. Unfortunately, it really has inflected down. I wouldn't say that Moore's Law has ended, but certainly the slope of improvements has inflected down, and we think that this will continue going forward. So to get around that, to be able to continue to drive the performance density and power efficiency, we're having to take alternative methods to get more silicon, more transistors into each chip. Chiplets and advanced packaging have already delivered and will deliver a lot of additional options. 
you know, from the monolithic uh, silicon days where you could have one chip in a package that really could be no larger than a reticle, and even if it made it close to a reticle, the cost was prohibitive. From that, we moved to multi-chip modules, to chiplets where you have, in addition to a large number of chips, you're using heterogeneous processes to tune the process to the type of logic or uh, problem that you're trying to solve with that particular chiplet. To now 2D and 3D uh, technologies and full up 3D stack technologies. We've gone from an era where we can get seven to 800 square millimeters of silicon into a package to well over 3,000 uh, with what we'll be delivering this year. Uh, and if you include the memory that, that Samsung mentioned as well, you know, over 14,000 square millimeters of silicon in one package, and I see no reason that that's going to stop anytime soon. So that's going to continue, and that has helped a lot with driving that, that uh, performance density. The other aspects of the system design are also critically important, and here's one area where OCP has really made a difference in driving power efficiency of all of the steps of delivery, of driving efficiency of fans, of driving efficiency of cooling writ large, of embracing liquid cooling and driving that going forward, and that's going to be critically important. I completely agree with Zane on that going forward. Every aspect here is important, as well as just driving the PUE in the data center as well, because that's the multiplicative factor, the power utilization efficiency at the data center infrastructure level, that's a multiplicative factor that makes this whole problem worse or better. If we look forward beyond what we've already done, what's next? I think you know, it's clear from the silicon side that we're going to see as we proliferate these workloads, we're gonna see core and CPU designs that are targeted for different types of workloads. At AMD, we've already introduced a line of, of general purpose processors and a line operated, uh, sorry, optimized for cloud and throughput uh, applications with different cores, with different, at least physical designs on the cores. I think you're going to see that more broadly. And Zane mentioned uh, Intel is pursuing this uh, path as well with their forthcoming Sierra Forest. I think you're going to see more targeted use of accelerators. Now, accelerators are a great weapon because they can provide tremendous improvements in performance and power efficiency for targeted workloads. But you should do it judiciously and where it makes sense. The most obvious and highest profile example of that today, of course, is AI. And GPUs and specialized chips do an outstanding job in providing power efficient and performance dense solutions for those workloads. And then very important, the continued innovation around the system level to provide modular systems with really increasingly liquid cooling is going to be absolutely essential. Because the, perform the power density of, of the silicon is going to continue to increase. So I think Zane mentioned 1,000 watts uh, in forthcoming uh, chips. I think certainly GPUs are well on their way towards 1,600 or more watts per GPU, and it's hard to see where that stops. So liquid cooling is going to go from a nice to have and an experimentation to absolutely critical for any modern deployment. And so the, what I want to leave you with is, you know, I do think that putting together the progress that we've already made, that we can face the immediate challenge of getting room in our data centers for AI, but we've got to be in this for the long haul. And so commit to continue to drive power efficiency and performance density across every aspect of the data center. Support open innovation by doing it in concert with one another in forums such as OCP and UEE and others. And the last thought I'd leave you with is we're going to want to make sure that we're tracking how we're doing. And so use open verifiable benchmarks to track the progress. Demand that of yourselves, demand that of your partners, demand that of your suppliers uh, so that we can track and understand where we're going. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and thank you for all the efforts at OCP. Thanks a lot.